Welcome to the American Lung Association Better Breathers Club member educational webinar, Understanding the Respiratory System and Lung Disease. My name is Nicole Goldsborough, National Manager for Lung Health Education at the American Lung Association. Before we get started, as a reminder, at the bottom of your screen, there are multiple application widgets you can use. All of the boxes are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop space. For the be best viewing experience, we recommend using a wired internet connection and closing any programs or browser sessions running in the background that could cause issues. For the best audio quality, please make sure your computer speakers or headset are turned on and the volume is up so you can hear the presenter and make sure the media player on your screen is enabled. If you are having any technical difficulties during the webcast, please let us know via the Q&A box. If you have questions during the webcast, you can submit them through the Q&A box. This webcast is being recorded and will be available tomorrow and can be accessed using the same link you used to register. And just as a reminder, the presenters cannot give medical advice during the webinar. Always consult your personal physician or healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding your specific medical condition. So let's take a look at today's agenda. We'll start by reviewing the American Lung Association and Better Breathers Club Network understanding the respiratory system and lung disease. Then we'll hear from a Better Breathers Club member, and then we'll transition to the questions and answers. So our speakers today include Bev Stewart, National Senior Director from the American Lung Association, myself, Nicole Goldsboro, National Manager, from the American Lung Association, Dr. Panagis Galiasetos, pulmonologist from the Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland, and Ellen, Better Breathers Club member um, from California. So next, I will turn it over to Ben Stewart to talk about the American Lung Association and Better Breathers Club network. Thanks so much, Nicole, and thanks to everybody for joining. I'm so excited that you're here to hear a little bit more about the upcoming Better Breathers Network and also to learn much more about the respiratory system and how it works today. The first thing that I would like to do, since you've heard just a tad about us, is start with a polling question. You'll see there are answers to what part of the country that you're located in, and I'd love it if you'd take a moment to just show us um, it would be great to get a view of um, who we're reaching out in the United States. We have over 500 Better Breathers Clubs in 48 different states, and um, we'd love to be able to see a representation across the country from everybody. So I'm going to give you just a couple more seconds to pick um, which of these categories makes best fits where you're living right now and breathing. And so in three two, one. I'm going to show you where we're at. All right. Hey to the Hawaii folks. Thanks for joining. Um, and it looks like we've got pretty good representation around the country. Um, thanks for participating in that poll, y'all. So I'd like to touch briefly on the American Lung Association uh, we've got a vital mission. It's to save lives by improving lung health and preventing lung disease. And we're doing this through a plethora of different ways because we have a very bold vision. And our vision is a world free of lung disease. We have to break that down to make it manageable steps moving in the right direction. So we take that bold vision and that encompassing mission, and we've come up with strategic imperatives, which is our fancy way of saying this is what we want to focus on. And so we've got a couple of them that really stand out. Um, and the first one to be defeating lung cancer. We know that lung cancer is the number one cancer killer of men and women in the United States. And so we've created a movement called Lung Force. 
It's our nationwide strategic cause campaign, and we're calling on all Americans to raise their voices and defeat this devastating disease. Our second strategic imperative is to improve the air we breathe so it doesn't cause or worsen lung disease. The American Lung Association works hard to protect the public health from unhealthy air pollution, and, and we support the Clean Air Act because we know that all Americans should have the right to air that is healthy and safe to breathe. You can learn more about this through our annual State of the Air Report, which analyzes data so it's easier to compare and understand air quality direct specifically in your community. Our third strategic imperative is to reduce the burden of lung disease on individuals and their families. Uh, we know both are vitally important. And the Lung Association is a premier resource for any lung health related question, from the common flu to lung cancer, pneumonia, COPD, sarcoidosis. Um, we encourage you to check out our website on the plethora of resources that are available, um, regardless of what uh, chronic lung disease you may be impacted by. We also have a national lung helpline. It's staffed by registered nurses and respiratory therapists, and they're ready and willing to take your questions. Our fourth strategic imperative is to eliminate tobacco use and tobacco-related diseases. And we're working really hard to strengthen laws and policies and make sure everyone's safe from secondhand smoke and the deadly effects of tobacco use. We have another report, our State of Tobacco Control, that tracks state and federal level um, policies and offers solutions. So I encourage you to check that out and see how your state is doing. Our fifth strategic imperative is how we get done all these other things. We want to make sure that we are um, utilizing resources to the best possible way, encouraging and um, empowering our volunteers and lead volunteer leadership to make the changes that we're all working so desperately to um, achieve as quickly as possible. So I wanted to touch briefly on the Better Breathers Club. I know that this is a program that most of you are familiar with um, and, and part of. The, in case there's a couple people on the call who are not part of a Better Breathers Club, I can set the stage by saying these are support groups for anybody with a chronic lung disease, and they usually meet monthly in communities across the country. They are led by a volunteer trained facilitator from the Lung Association and um, supported through additional resources that the American Lung Association has. If you are not yet part of a Better Breathers Club, you can go to our website at lung.org backslash better breathers, and you'll be able to locate the Better Breathers Club closest to you. And if you hit the register now button, that'll indicate to us that you'd like to be on their mailing list, and um, it can get you in touch with the facilitator so that we can make sure that you have a great experience when you join a Better Breathers Club. We know that Better Breathers Clubs um, have been around for 50 years because they are effective and they, and they fill a niche in the community, providing skills and education to individuals living with chronic lung disease. We know that, they, that the members um, love this opportunity to share ideas and solutions, and there's a lot of social benefits to being part of a Better Breathers Club as well. The thing that we're really excited about and that I think you're going to love too, is we're, being, we're right on the cusp of launching what we're calling the American Lung Association Better Breathers Network. And this is going to be an engaged network of members um, who attend Better Breathers Clubs all the time or sometimes, uh, or maybe they're too far away from a Better Breathers Club to attend or, um, or are limited by mobility to stay home. But what the plan is to strengthen the connection between um, these individuals, each other, and the American Lung Association so we can share resources. So if you've been on our website and you've registered for our club, you're on our list and you can expect in the next couple months to receive a membership card. Starting in the new year, we're going to start some electronic newsletters and we're going to be counting on all of you to help us figure out what content you're most interested in hearing about so that this newsletter is the best information possible to support you. We're also rolling out with some new health education materials that are going to be facts about specific lung diseases, but also where to find resources to support your journey in self-management. Um, we've also planned things like this educational webinar. We've got a couple more on the docket that we're putting on the calendar. One of them to be understanding the tests and the procedures that diagnose lung disease, 
and another to really dive into the different types of research and clinical trials. We'll come up with more in the future, but those are the two that are coming up next. What I'd like to do now is introduce Dr. G to talk about the respiratory system. Um, he is um, he's a great friend to the American Lung Association and has supported much of the work that we do and is um, an, an amazing advocate and physician in his own community. As the assistant professor at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine where he is the co-director for the Medicine for Greater Good. He's also a community engagement co-director for the Baltimore Breathe Center. He, um, he truly emulates this idea that you are a physician in the community. Um, and we're so grateful that he's taken time out of his day to talk to us. So go ahead, Dr. G. Excellent, and thank you so much. And um, uh, I, I apologize, I have a very long Greek name. So uh, Dr. G is what all my patients lovingly call me. Um, so for, uh, for you all out there, you are welcome to save your uh, hands from typing so much or um, so many syllables, so Dr. G is uh, perfectly fine to uh, uh, refer to me as. This is a great honor. <clears throat> I love uh, being a lung doctor. I'm very biased about the lungs, um, so whenever I go out to give community talks, um, especially if they're around the lungs, I always get really excited. I'm like, oh, you guys are, you know, a breath of fresh air. I use a lot of lung-related jokes, so um, just to show you how much I really enjoy this organ. But with that said, it does affect um, the lungs do uh, have a variety of diseases to them. And I think what's going to be great to learn today is recognizing what makes the lungs so amazing, but also at that same time it makes them so fragile and vulnerable to a variety of um, uh, both intrinsic variables as well as extrinsic variables. And then at the end of it, we'll go over some techniques that people can do to maintain lung health, uh, regardless of whatever disease should be impacting them as well. So uh, I don't have any major disclosures, um, and I think I've been uh, introduced uh, a little bit about my background, so um, thank you for that. By the way, the other thing as well about me is that I am the director for the Tobacco Treatment Clinic uh, here at uh, Johns Hopkins uh, campus, um, and today's our smoke out date, uh, our smoke out. So for all of you who know a person who smokes, um, uh, today will be a great day to just let them know how much you love them, and hopefully uh, you can direct them towards some resources to help them quit smoking. So our objectives for today is to go over the lungs um, overall, just to understand the, how amazing they are, but also at the same time what makes them so vulnerable to a variety of diseases. Um, then we'll go over the uh, risk factors for those diseases, and the risk factors will dichotomize them into um, ones that um, we really can't do much about um, because these are like your genetics, for instance, and your family history, and other ones that are, malleable, uh, that are modifiable, um, such as uh, certain lifestyles, uh, lifestyles and so forth. And then we'll talk about actions that you can do uh, in order to help improve your lungs uh, regardless of, of disease or, or current state. So plenty of things that we can always do to improve our lungs. So first, right off the bat, I love to bring up the lungs um, to begin with. I mean, the lungs are really what allow us to do what we do. Um, they are organs that are, um, allow us to take in the oxygen, get out the CO2, but they're the same organs that allow us to maintain our endurance. Uh, the lungs, as you will see, are rather resilient. Um, certain people, such as John Wayne, who had one of his lungs removed, and the remaining lung helped uh, compensate over time, even growing to fill the rest of his chest cavity. So the lungs are resilient. They are in, uh, every breath you take uh, puts them in, uh, into an interaction with the environment. So they are rather resilient, but at the same time, they're still rather fragile. But the lungs, again, um, they, from the second you're born up until about the age of 35, your lung endurance continues to grow and grow and grow. After the age of 35, they do begin to lose some of that endurance uh, over, over those years, about um, 10 milliliters of lung function does begin to decline, but there's other ways to compensate for that loss. So, you know, our 70-year-old patients can still have relatively some level of endurance as a 30-year-old individual. So we'll go over those techniques uh, in a little bit. I do want to emphasize that uh, an oversimplification that I give about the lungs is that there are really three main components to them. So this is the airways, right, and the airways are usually what we tend to target as physicians um, and healthcare professionals through our medication. So every inhaler that you use is really intended to help the airways, and whether that's to open them up, right, through uh, bronchodilators, or to calm the uh, inflammation that is happening in the airways. So in a lot of asthmatics or patients with chronic bronchitis, the inhaled corticosteroids helps 
decrease the inflammation uh, that they see that they exhibit as coughing, sputum, and, and phlegm. Lung tissue, right, so this is kind of where the lung airways sit in, right? The lung tissue is kind of the muscle of the lung in of itself. Uh, the medical term that we use is the lung parenchyma. The lung parenchyma gets a lot of uh, notoriety in a sense of that's where um, we see, for instance, acute lung injuries happening when you injure the lung tissue in of itself. Right now, that uh, portion of the lung is getting a lot of visibility through the uh, new, uh, through the creation of these uh, electronic uh, cigarette vaping acute lung injuries. So those are lung injuries that tend to happen within the lung parenchyma. The lung parenchyma is also where the majority of lung cancers tend to uh, evolve out of. And the last part that I don't think ends up getting as much emphasis as it should is your lung's blood supply. So your lungs have really two blood supplies. One is the blood supplies that feed the lungs themselves. That's your bronchial uh, uh, arterial and venous supply of blood. So that supplies the lungs the blood that it needs in order to maintain uh, its function. But then you also have the pulmonary circulation. So this is the blood that the heart pumps out that needs to get oxygenated, comes back to the heart, and it sends it to the rest of the body, oxygen-rich blood. And at the same time, it also gets the CO2 out as well. I say the, why this is important to me is because, as you'll see, one of the techniques of helping lung endurance maintain oftentimes really implies how strengthening the individual's lung supply, uh, blood supply, meaning not getting that more blood, but how can the blood move through the lungs more efficiently? And we'll talk about those techniques uh, uh, later on because those techniques are important in order to compensate sometimes for irreversible airway damage or irreversible lung tissue damage. So this is a part where we are going to ask, hopefully you've been listening attentively to what I've just said. So what are the functions of the respiratory system? So I'm going to take a pause here to allow for a few seconds of you all to weigh in. There are no grades that I'll uh, be collecting, so don't feel that you have to impress the speaker. But I'll uh, allow this for a few more seconds, and then we'll move on. All right, excellent. So what are the functions of the respiratory system? So breathing, we are the Better Breathers Club, so I, I think that uh, goes without saying that hopefully that was a, 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 an answer that you selected or considered strongly. Getting oxygen into the body and the carbon dioxide out. Speaking is one that most people don't recognize. It is the lungs. That we may say, oh, it's the vocal cords, but the vocal cords need to be impacted and moved by the air that's exhaled out. So lungs are highly important to letting people speak. And actually, it's one of the reasons why we see as lung function tends to decline, whether it's because of a disease or, or age, for instance, speaking for long periods of time gets incredibly impacted uh, by how strong the lungs are to begin with. And I love this last one. I was like, you know, just keeping you alive. Though I will have a lot of cardiothoracic surgical friends who will tell me, well, I can keep you alive uh, through um, ECMO, right? So taking blood out, oxygenating it into a machine and removing the CO2 and putting it back in. So I understand if you didn't want to select keeping you alive because you thought of these other technological advances, I would give you a pass. But really, everything, all the above is the correct answer to all of this. So hopefully you all uh, were selecting that. And we'll go ahead and click it and, and move on. Oh, so perfect. So we got to see this. So all of the above, good. Looks like a variety of you uh, already were going towards that. So. Moving forward, what is the respiratory system? So just to be a little bit more uh, nuanced about the certain categories. So when we go out into our schools and teach the children about lung anatomy, because we use it as a basis to understand, well, how does lung pathology, how does lung diseases come about? We always love to kind of go over the airways pretty extensively because a lot of the lung diseases tend to be centered on the airways, whether it's asthma or COPD. And what I, what I don't think a lot of people tend to appreciate is that the trachea, the windpipe, is kind of the beginning portions of the lung airways, even though it's outside of the lungs to begin with. Most people can feel the trachea right in their necks. Um, that's that, uh, the windpipe, essentially, and you can even feel the cartilage rings that surround it to protect it if, if, if God forbid, some uh, injury ever happens to the neck. But as the trachea comes into the uh, chest cavity, it bifurcates right around your clavicle area into the left 
uh, airway and to the right airway, which gives way to the left and right lung. So I apologize, as lung doctors, we are not too clever with names, so we name the left lung the left lung and the right lung the right lung. And those airways are still filled with a lot of cartilage to protect them, but as they go smaller, uh, more narrow, uh, as they go more distally into the lungs, the bronchi, which are the more proximal portions of the uh, airways that are covered in cartilage, the bronchi begin to give out to what are called bronchioles. Bronchioles, that portion of the lung, is the portion where the cartilage is now lost, and it's a really thin membrane. And the thinness is warranted because at some point these bronchioles are going to terminate into what are called the alveoli. The alveoli are, are essentially like a cul-de-sac right at the end of the of the airways, uh, and it is their ending, because at that cul-de-sac, the air, uh, alveoli, that is where you're going to have your gas exchange. Oxygen is going to go in, and CO2 is going to come out. So the alveoli have to be incredibly thin to allow these particles to kind of freely move in and out um, pretty quickly, as one red blood cell that goes to an alveoli is there for less than one second. So this transportation has to happen instantaneously. The one muscle that I don't bring up a lot, but I'm going to emphasize it when we talk about lungs call to action, is the diaphragm. The diaphragm is its own muscle outside of the lungs, but it in of itself is what helps breathing happen, right? So, and if you think about your lungs, the way air moves in, if you think about them, it's similar to what a syringe does, right? As you pull a syringe, the negative pressure that is created inside the syringe allows fluid to come into it. And your diaphragm does just that. As it pulls down and expands the lungs, it allows air to come into the lungs because of negative pressure. So the diaphragm is an important muscle because when we teach you some breathing techniques at the end, you're going to be using your diaphragm in order to do that. So this is a slide that's meant to be interactive, but it, it captures exactly what we said. Um, the oxygen that is in the air has to make its way all the way down the trachea to the bronchi to the bronchioles and then into the alveoli and then that red blood cell that's going to come by that one alveoli has less than a second to get the CO2 out and the oxygen in. This is happening every second of the day, every breath that you take and that's an amazing feat that the lungs have to do in order to keep us alive as you all selected with a prior question. In order to get the oxygen in, it depends on a lot of variables, right? So we need to make sure the lungs are working. But what about the environment itself? So things that help the oxygen get into our lungs appropriately, one of it is the barometric pressure of the environment. The other one is also the amount of oxygen that is in the air. And so with that, I think, helps move us to our next question, with, which is what percentage of oxygen is in the air that we breathe? And I, if there's an all the above, there isn't. Good. Because if you saw all of the above, please do not select that. So do you think it's 5%, 15%, 21%, or 50%? I'm going to give you all about five seconds to select. All right. So I, as the moderator, will go ahead and choose the answer. 21% is it. Let's see how you all did. So fantastic. The majority of you got it correct. Uh, so 21%. It does not mean that throughout the history of this planet that we've always been at 21%. Actually, we had higher oxygen levels um, up until the 50%, uh, especially during the dinosaur times where a lot of people speculate that higher oxygenation levels allowed the dinosaurs to grow to the size that they did. And then after uh, the asteroids and so forth, the oxygen levels actually fell pretty drastically, about to, uh, anywhere from 10 to 15%. And this allowed the uh, birth of small mammals to really come about and insects and so forth. So where we're at at 21% is a great number for us as human beings, so that's what we're working with with regards to our lung function. Now the last part is really important for me to go over because this is the part that I want to emphasize is so fragile to injury. So as you go deeper and deeper into the airways, you eventually get to the bronchioles, which is the portion of the lungs that don't have the cartilage. And the, that's allowed in order to allow blood supply to feed the lung tissue and the lung airways, but also to make way for the alveoli. And the alveoli is exactly what I said earlier. It's the cul-de-sac at the end where you allow oxygen to come in and CO2 to be cleared. The next slide, actually, you may not appreciate this slide as much as I do because being a lung doctor, we do look at lung biopsies pretty frequently. But the one thing I want you to take away from this biopsy is how much empty space exists, right? 
you see lung tissue, but it is not making up the majority of the film, right? The reason being is we need the lungs make way to allow as much air to come to a very thin portion of the lungs. And that thin portion, the alveoli, is really made up of two or three cells, and they're called pneumocyte 1 and pneumocyte 2. But that fragility also makes it so vulnerable to diseases. So when you inhale, for instance, tobacco smoke, right, the alveoli is what gets damaged immediately and creates emphysema. When patients inhale air pollution, the alveoli, again, are what the parts that become injured almost immediately and impact the ability of gas exchange to happen. So while the alveoli are, are beautifully constructed in your airways to allow this, uh, this beautiful symphony of oxygen in and CO2 out, that fragileness also makes it so vulnerable to a variety of toxins that we would breathe in that could create uh, lung pathology overall. So next I want to go over, well, what symptoms can we really think about exhibiting that we may say we should focus on the lungs? And the one thing I love to bring up is, well, if lungs make us breathe, becoming short of breath could be a sign of lung disease. Now, I want to make it clear that beginning short of breath is what every human being exhibits at some level of endurance. So if I went about to do an exercise regime that is on par with Michael Phelps, the Olympian swimmer, I promise you I will fatigue much quicker than him and I'll be short of breath. That isn't pathology. That's just to say that my lung endurance is not where Michael Phelps's lung endurance is. Shortness of breath, uh, when you recognize that you have maintained your exercise regimen, you've maintained your endurance level, but suddenly you're becoming shorter of breath, you're becoming more short of breath with activities that you've never found yourself to be short of breath doing, that's when you should become alarmed and notify doctors. Patients who, the, their lungs, when, as lungs decline, your lung function will be the first thing that gets robbed. And so that's why I always love my athletes when they come and talk to me, is because even though their numbers on lung function tests may look quote unquote normal, they were probably operating at super normal levels to begin with, and as their lung function was robbed because of certain diseases, they became more in tune with that and reported it back to me. So keep a close eye on what your endurance level is because that's the first part that will really be heavily impacted if, if God forbid, you are ever struck with a lung disease. Next is cough. So I want to make this very clear. Your lung organ, the organ of your lung, has no pain receptors in it. If you have chest pain, it's usually something happening outside of the lungs. If the lung exhibits, for instance, a bad blood clot that shuts up blood supply to a portion of the lung, you may still not exhibit pain unless that portion of the lung is right next to the lung tissue that is outside of the lung. So the lungs don't have pain receptors. And this makes a little bit of sense from an evolutionary standpoint is because if the lungs told you you had pain, it doesn't really help you. It, you know, what am I supposed to do with it? So the lungs have a, an abundant amount is cough receptors which also makes sense because if something is in the lungs that the lungs don't want, the only way to get it out is for a cough. So your lungs have an abundant amount of cough receptors, which is good and bad for me. I love it. Coughing gets things out of the lungs that the lungs don't want in. But for patients, it can be a nuisance because say you had a bad viral infection, guess what's going to happen? You're going to cough a lot. And as a lung doctor, when patients come to see me about a cough, I always let them know I, I can happily try to suppress it um, but for the most part, that's your lungs just trying to clear things out. And especially after a bad lung injury sometimes, say someone had a bad pneumonia, as the lungs heal, patients may exhibit coughing because those are cough receptors re-emerging um, from the newly healed lung tissue. So coughing serves us a great, uh, a great uh, part for the lungs to keep the airways nice and clear. And then finally, sputum production. Again, if your lungs get things in that they don't want in, that you will try to coat it with some level of sputum or phlegm is another synonym. And guess what? Once that's made to get it out, what we do, we cough it. So those are usually the symptoms of lungs. Can you be short of breath? Can you exhibit a cough? Can you have sputum production without having a disease happening? Of course, right? Your lungs can do this on a daily basis depending on what they breathe in. But if these are happening very frequently, and they're tied in with other symptoms like fevers and chills, then really go to your doctor and talk about what could be happening. Could you have a bad lung infection or could you be exhibiting other lung diseases? And if we do have a lung concern, if this organ is being injured in some way from, a, uh, from an acute illness or a chronic disease, we have, as lung physicians, a variety of tools that we use as for diagnostic workup. So imaging, getting a chest 
uh, CAT scan is usually one of the best ways that we can do, and getting the chest CT allows us to do a three-dimensional review of the lungs, and usually we request it without contrast, so it's a pretty quick test. Then we do lung function. Lung functions are great because the lung functions actually test those three areas of the lung. It tests the strength of the airways, it tests the um, stability of the lung tissue, the lung parenchyma, and it tells us how well the lung circulation is working. So the lung function tests are great, and um, while it's time consuming, it can take up to 30 minutes to do it, but it really tells us what we're looking at in regards to a lung pathology, lung diseases, because the lung function test can help differentiate is the lung disease happening in the airways, the lung tissue, or the lung circulation, and that allows the physician at least to hone in on a diagnosis. We also do a variety of blood work in order to kind of assess certain types of diseases or get blood work to identify a disease. And that cardiogram, people always think that's interesting. Why would I look at the heart if I'm a lung doctor? Well, two reasons. One is if the heart's not working, you can exhibit the same symptoms as a lung disease, right? Patients can get cough, they can make sputum, and they can make uh, and they, they can make them short of breath if their heart's not working because of the congestion that the heart will do with the blood back flowing into the lungs. But the other part that I use an echocardiogram for is to evaluate how well the right side of the heart is working. If the right side of the heart seems to be impacted, and the only way it can be impacted is by having rather severe lung disease. Rather severe lung disease can put extra pressure on the right side of the heart, so sometimes I will get an echocardiogram to rule out a heart disease, but also see how well the right side of the heart is doing. And sometimes we do ask patients to do a little bit more invasive procedures. One is a bronchoscopy, or as I like to tell patients, it's the, essentially it's a colonoscopy for the lungs, where we take a video camera into your lungs and look around the airways. And sometimes with that, we'll take some biopsies or do a lavage in order to get cell samples out. And biopsies we can do through a bronchoscopy, or if we're really don't know what could be going on, we do ask you to see our surgical colleagues to pursue a surgical lung biopsy. Now, there are risk factors for having lung disease, and these are things that I would always encourage patients uh, and community members to take on. So if you're sitting there taking notes and discussing what could I do for my community to improve the Better Breathers Club and all my community members here, one of the first things I discuss is try to teach one another how to take a family history. And family histories are not the most exciting things to take because it brings up a lot of morbid conversations. How did grandmom or grandfather die, for instance? But it's so important to understand what your family has gone through from a health standpoint because those genes tend to be inherited. So that's the discussion about heritability versus just genetic inheritance, right? So we all inherit a lot of genes, but it's hard to know if those genes are going to make an impact on us and the only way really to know is if those genes have impacted others. So if you find that asthma has been in your brothers, your sisters, your aunts and uncles, you may have that same asthma gene and likely to exhibit those same asthma symptoms. Versus if you go and send off your genes and you are told you have a gene for asthma, but no one in your family's ever had asthma before, that gene may just stay silent in you and never turn back on or turn on. So I always encourage to go about and talk to your families about family history. And you know what? Next week is Thanksgiving. I'm not encouraging you all to go about and ask for family history during that time, but it might be an opportunity just to get to know your own health and your own genes in the most inexpensive way, talking to your family about it. So we went over um, genetics, and their genes do run for a variety of diseases, from COPD to um, asthma to a variety of other rare lung diseases, such as um, uh, hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia and alpha-1 antitrypsin. So please, doing a family history is so vital. And as a physician, I always ask all my patients, does anyone else in your family have a lung disease? Because that usually helps me with my diagnostic testing. Tobacco use is what I would say a patient-level modifiable risk factor. And with this statistic, I wanted to show off that recently the U.S. Surgeon General did discuss that the adult usage of cigarettes is the lowest it's ever been in America in quite some time, down to 13.7%. But I always say do not take your foot off the pedal because we shouldn't applaud ourselves yet. Tobacco use is actually, though, unfortunately, one of the largest health disparities that we are facing. So more minorities smoke than they ever have um, versus non-minority uh, races and ethnicities. 
from a uh, socioeconomic status, the gaps between the haves and the have-nots is the widest it has ever been. So uh, persons of low socioeconomic status tend to smoke more than persons from a more affluent socioeconomic status. Patients with uh, mental health issues, being a, a member of the American Lung Association as well as other pulmonary organizations, one of them being the American Thoracic Society, I'll never forget being part of a conversation on how to best manage patients who do smoke and a psychologist stood in front of us and pleaded what kills her patients is not their mental health issues, it's smoking. Smoking is the number one cause of death for patients with mental health issues, so smoking-related diseases. So while we should be excited that the prevalence overall in America is low in regards to smoking, we should recognize that the disparities around smoking is the greatest that it's ever been in the United States. And so if we want to make an impact, we have to work with uh, our patients and get to know them, right, from uh, going out and working with patients of a variety of races and ethnicities to really understand how tobacco is impacting their day-to-day -day lives. And then there are certain environmental situations, and I call them uh, these risk factors more at a community level because it's hard to change uh, someone's uh, living standards. Uh, if you live in a rural area, I'm not encouraging you to leave a rural area, but we do recognize that rural areas can be more influential to development of COPD um, as well as certain uh, lung cancers. Uh, socioeconomic status has been linked as well to certain lung health outcomes and then pollution, which I feel like makes sense uh, when you think about it. But the one part about pollution that I'd like to emphasize is when I say pollution, I think people think about the pollution they go out and breathe in. But pollution I actually mean is indoor air pollution. Uh, we, uh, out of my research group, we have shown that 82% of a uh, Baltimore City person's time is spent indoors. So the air quality you're breathing in indoors is very influential to development of lung disease as well as to the management of lung diseases. Uh, we often go out to public housing units and we really try to help with the air filter system because if someone is smoking in apartment B, that air smoke will travel into apartment C and suddenly that child and parent's asthma flares up and there isn't an inhaler in the world that's going to offset the secondhand smoke that they'll breathe in. So I want to be really cognizant that when we talk about air pollution, yes, we should be mindful of the outdoor air 100%, but also don't dismiss the indoor air quality and the amount of impact it will make on patients. Actually, one of my strongest recommendations with all my patients is always a HIPAA filter, regardless of their lung disease. A HEPA filter, H-E-P-A, uh, is inexpensive to buy at Home Depot. And sometimes if you have a big house, just focus the HEPA filters to be somewhere where you spend the majority of your time, such as your bedroom where most patients will be sleeping. So air quality is very vital. Now, what can we do to make sure our lungs are as healthy as it can be? Even though Dr. G did say that after the age of 35, the lung health does begin to decline physiologically, normally, not uh, anything that you can prevent. So the one thing I will always say, talk to your doctor if you experience any of these symptoms. Changes in endurance, right? You all know what you can do and not do, right? If you can climb up 10 flights of stairs without any issues, by all means, that's your baseline. But if you do it and find that you're struggling, you should report that to your doctor. We all cough, I've coughed before, but if you find that your cough has increased in frequency or it's become productive, right? Maybe there's a dry cough and now phlegm is coming out you should let your doctor know. But also when you talk to your doctor, talk to him or her about all the exposures around you. And this is really important. If you have pets at home, let them know. If you tend to work on farms or live near farmland, let them know. Because sometimes even if you're not a farmer yourself, you would breathe in a lot of the fertilizer that the winds will carry. And those fertilizers carry a lot of allergens that people just aren't aware of. So please just make sure that you take a nice inventory of all the environmental surroundings that uh, you could potentially be breathing in that could be contributing to your symptoms as well as a potential disease. So the um, diagnostic workup, I think we've already discussed that we, um, there's a variety of tests that we do. And you should be mindful when the doctor tells you we'd like to do some tests, ask him or her what those tests are meant to do. I see this because some tests are meant to really rule out diseases. So sometimes, for instance, I will send a patient for lung function tests. Lung function tests rarely diagnose asthma because asthma, by definition, means it's a reversible disease. So if you're not in an active asthma flare, your lung function is normal. So when patients go and get normal lung function tests, I let them know that's helping me rule out another disease. 
it does not mean I can rule in asthma at this moment. So always ask the doctor, what are you looking for when you send off this test? And also, once you've been diagnosed, we do do a variety of testing that further helps us with a prognosis and expectation. So for instance, um, if you have a disease like sarcoidosis, we may ask you to do lung function tests almost every year just to see how well preserved your lung function is. Versus patients with COPD, after the diagnosis of the lung function test, we may not ask you to do another set of lung function tests unless your endurance changes or your symptoms change. So COPD, usually we need one lung function test to diagnose it. And usually you can be perfectly fine without repeating it for quite some time. Now, other things, uh, we have a variety of uh, medications. These are inhalers. Sometimes we use antibiotics and sometimes we use steroids. If you're being given any of these, talk to your doctor about expectations and why you're being put on that. I'm going to quickly get to a few other things near the end, um, but there are a variety of other novel pharmacological agents, and these usually just depend on the lung disease that you have and the diagnosis you've been given. So talk to your doctor about why you're being put on these other uh, novel therapies. Now, what can you do at home? Oh, I apologize. The most invasive uh, uh, cure can sometimes be surgery, and that could either be removing parts of the lungs that are so diseased that we need to take them out, or sometimes the most uh, severe uh, surgical intervention is lung transplant. So if you do get diagnosed with a lung disease, I would encourage you to talk to your doctor. Is lung transplant a consideration for the disease I have, and what can I do to prevent my lungs from getting so bad that that's what I would need? So a few other things that you can do. So hydration. Hydration is so important to the lungs, right? In order to make that, uh, your lungs, all your airways will have a very thin level of, of mucus that's normal, and that keeps particles that land on your lung airways from doing any further damage to the lungs, right? So keeping that thin layer of mucus can only happen if you stay well hydrated. So by all means, I usually tell my patients, kick your day off with two full glasses of water. That usually puts your lungs in a good mood right, right off the bat, because usually you've been dehydrated for those eight hours, not drinking while you're sleeping. And then posture. Posture will help your diaphragm. So sitting upright, breathing and letting gravity do all the work is one thing that your lungs love. So I always encourage my patients, work on your posture because slouching over and so forth means you can't expand your lungs to a full capacity and actually may cause a bit of the lung at the bases to collapse on its own until you pop it open with proper posture. So our moms were 100% correct to correct us on our posture at the dinner table. Your diet, so we have been finding more and more that certain diets definitely impact the lungs. Uh, diets especially rich in uh, omega-3 uh, oils, such as fish, uh, diets high in fish or diets high in, in greens, such as spinach, we lo the lungs tend to love that kind of diet. So I would say if you've been diagnosed with a lung disease, talk to your doctor about a specific, are there any specific diets that they would encourage. I always encourage uh, anything that's fish-based as well as leafy green is great for certain lung diseases such as asthma. So talk to your doctor about what diet could help, but there's also diets that would, we know definitely will not help. So if you're recognizing, for instance, um, a lot of uh, fat tissue accumulating around your abdomen, though that might be a diet that's not great for your abdomen, but it's also going to be not great for your lungs as well. The same receptors that cause the uh, abdominal fat to accumulate will also cause sometimes your lungs to exhibit symptoms like asthma. And then exercise. I think this is my closing comment. Uh, it will be my closing comment just given the timing, but exercise. And by all means, exercise does not mean running off and joining a gym. Exercise can mean, for instance, uh, maybe you do some daily chores at home. Time yourself. The next day, try to do them faster. Why? Why am I such a big uh, stickler on exercise? Because if you have damaged lungs for a variety of reasons, um, one way to improve your lungs is exercising. What happens is getting the blood to flow faster through your lungs, your blood supply and your lungs are very smart. If they find that they're going to inefficient parts of the lungs because they are diseased, they're going to flip and say, no, let's start shunting you away and send you to healthier portions of the lungs. So exercise can help healthy parts of the lungs get even bigger and take over a little bit of the diseased lungs. This is why John Wayne could live with one lung, and by the end of his life, when he died during an autopsy, they found that one lung expanded greatly because he used it incredibly. So keep that in mind. This is why we as doctors, lung doctors, encourage pulmonary rehabilitation, for instance, is to take your lung blood supply and rework it through exercise to make it more efficient 
and send it to healthier parts of the lungs, and patients will feel that difference. Even if your lung function test doesn't show numbers that will improve, your symptoms are more important to us, and most patients will say, my endurance has improved. So that's it. That's my call to action to everyone. And I'll leave you all with this last slide, but thank you for this opportunity, and now I'm going to turn it over uh, to our next presenter. Dr. G, thank you so much um, for your presentation. I really, we definitely really appreciate it. Um, next, I'm really excited to introduce Ellen, who is a Better Breathers Club member from California, and she'll be sharing her experience attending a club as well as um, some other really wonderful um, insights. So, Ellen, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Nicole. Hi, I'm Ellen. If you hear a long pause during my presentation, no, you haven't lost your connection. I'm just taking a breath. I am a wife, mother, and grandmother who is living with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, and I've been on oxygen therapy for 12 years. I am a proud member of my local Kaiser Permanente Better Breathers Club. The picture that you see on your screen was taken at the finish line of the American Lung Association 2019 Lung Force Walk. I was proud to finish the half mile course, specific course specifically designed for those with lung disease. Included in this picture is my support team. My husband, Jerry, is the big guy on my right, Michelle, who is our fearless Better Breathers Club leader is on my left, and Michelle's husband, Jim, is conveniently hiding behind her. You may, you may notice I use a different style of cannula. When I'm on my portable oxygen device, I use this Oximizer mustache style cannula. There is a pendant style that looks a lot nicer, but it wasn't, wasn't, wasn't a good fit for me. Both styles of Oximizer make oxygen delivery systems more efficient. When I could no longer ignore my shortness of breath during my daily activities, I received a referral to see a pulmonologist who scheduled extensive pulmonary tests prior to my first appointment. Both my husband and I were in shock because I went into the testing appointment without oxygen, then walked out of that appointment on supplemental oxygen. We were stunned. Our initial feeling was my COPD had control of my life and we worried about my future. Ultimately, we learned that this was not the case. I was fortunate to attend an outstanding pulmonary rehabilitation program that focused on education and development of individual exercise programs. I also attended American Lung Association Lung Force Expos that provided valuable information on how to improve my quality of life and about research that could result in better treatments for a variety of lung diseases. After pulmonary rehab, I looked for Better Breathers Club meeting locations in my area, but did not find any within my driving radius. When my husband retired, I was finally able to join a Better Breathers Club. This is one reason I feel this Better Breathers Club webinar series is so important because it can reach a greater number of people. After pulmonary rehab and until I joined a Better Breathers Club, I missed having interaction with people who have lung disease. While we have different lung diseases, we all know what it means to be out of breath, have a bad breathing day, our reactions to various medications, and the impact on us of a common cold or flu. Better Breathers Club members are a group of people, many of whom are not on oxygen, who have various lung diseases. We have an opportunity to share things that we have learned and experienced 
that help to improve our quality of life. We also have an ability, have an ability to interact with pulmonary medical staff who are usually available to answer our questions and assist us in a non-clinical environment. In addition, we have guest speakers who provide a wide variety of information tailored to people with lung disease. It is difficult for me to choose favorite topics that they have covered, but here are a few that stand out in my mind. A presentation on nutrition that include a better understanding of nutritional information on food products labels and the impact of food products on inflammation and lung disease. Information about Lung Force Expos and Lung Force Walks, plus other American Lung Association resources and activities. A presentation by the fire department about things we can do to improve their ability to help us during an emergency. Learning about different therapies and medical devices, including oxygen delivery systems for various lung diseases. Exercise programs such as bicycle, walking, and Tai Chi, as well as exercise activities you can do in your own home without extra equipment. If we have a topic that interests us, we feel free to su suggest it to our leader, to the leader of our Better Breathers Club. I find the Better Bre Breathers Club to be important because it gives me the tools to understand my lung disease, learn about treatment plans, and how to make changes to my daily activities that make living with lung disease easier. I encourage you to call your local American Lung Association or visit their website to get a list of Better Breathers Clubs in your area. If you feel a specific Better Breathers Club would be beneficial in your area, contact your local American Lung Association. An example would be for a group of veterans who have lung disease and would benefit from a Better Breathers Club. In summary, pulmonary rehabilitation and the Better Breathers Club have helped me understand that a diagnosis of lung disease is not the end of my life. My life has definitely changed, but they gave me the tools to control the progression of my disease and continue my lifestyle. Thank you for your time. I'll give it back to you, Nicole. Ellen, thank you so much for sharing your story and how you found the Better Breathers Club um, to be such a great resource for you. Um, next, I'm going to turn it over to the Q&A portion of today's webinar. I do recognize we are almost at the top of the hour, so I do want to just share if we are unable to get to your question, we will get back to you um, on that um, question just because we're running a little short on time. But if you do have a question, like I said, we will get back to you. Please feel free to enter it. Um, so one of the questions that came through, and this is for you, Dr. G, um, can you share some of the first signs of the COPD flare-up? Uh, the COPD flare-up, so that's, a, that's called a COPD exacerbation. So uh, the signs of it really go back to knowing who, what your signs are at baseline. Because what we put a lot of stock in when we talk to patients is an exacerbation, a flare-up implies that your normal baseline symptoms have suddenly worsened and that's an, almost an immediate uh, change. So what I always uh, tell patients is a flare-up happens very quickly. So it's not like, oh, over the last two weeks I found myself slowly and gradually progressing with this. That's, that's not a COPD flare-up. This would be pretty rapidly or pretty quickly within a 24-hour to 36-hour exposure. So it could be from a virus, um, it could be some environmental trigger. So knowing your baseline endurance, so you'll find yourself more short of breath. You are knowing your baseline cough, so if you're one that doesn't cough and suddenly you have a very frequent cough that's come on, that's a huge change. 
and then your sputum production. So sputum is the phlegm that we cough out, and for some patients, that is a normal part of their day. They will constantly put out a lot of phlegm. If you're a person who doesn't put out phlegm and suddenly you're putting out phlegm, notify your doctor immediately. But if you do put out phlegm, what we make, ask patients to be con, uh, cognizant of is, are you putting out more phlegm than usual, so the volume has increased, or has the color changed? So a COPD flare, how to recognize it, really begins with what do I consider as my normal baseline, and then recognizing when my shortness of breath has worsened, recognizing when my cough has worsened or it has come on, and recognizing that your sputum production has changed in volume, the amount, or changed in color, or just has come on and you're, you've been a person who's never made phlegm. If you recognize these three symptoms, or at least one of them, notify your doctor immediately to have a game plan about how to best manage that COPD exacerbation and ultimately prevent you from being hospitalized. Okay, thank you. Um, another question is, um, which diseases fall under COPD? So COPD is a disease that we can only identify using lung function tests. So what we're looking to see is does the air trying to leave your lungs during expiration, does all of it get, make its way out? So COPD, that O part, the obstruction, implies that air is obstructed from trying to be exhaled out. COPD, there's two real big diseases under that category, and that's emphysema and chronic bronchitis. Emphysema usually we diagnose you based on the CAT scan findings, and chronic bronchitis is usually diagnosed based on your symptoms, a person with a frequent cough and frequent uh, sputum production. Now you can have these two diseases without having COPD. To be diagnosed with COPD, you have to have the lung function tests in order to demonstrate that yes, air is struggling to be exhaled out. The reason why that's so important is starting inhalers on patients with emphysema or chronic bronchitis who don't exhibit that airflow limitation, that obstruction, they're not going to find any benefit from the inhaler. So that's one of the reasons I always emphasize the patient, even if we have signs of emphysema or chronic bronchitis, I still need the lung function test to make sure that you're going to be an appropriate candidate to get all the benefits out of inhaler rather than putting us at risk for the side effects. So those are the so under COPD, we usually see emphysema and chronic bronchitis, but COPD is a term used when we have proven there is airflow limitations when you try to exhale. Thank you. And we are at the top of the hour. Do we have time for one more question? Um, the question is, how does breathing cold air affect the lungs? So breathing cold air, so our lungs do not like cold air. This is why we always try to emphasize breathing through your nose. Your nose is anatomically beautifully made in the sense of how the blood supply gets to the nose in order to heat all the cold air that goes through it. Your mouth is very poorly uh, adapted to do this. So if you breathe cold air through your mouth, it's going to irritate your lungs a great deal. And when the lungs get irritated, the only thing they really do is tighten their airways. So they narrow their airways. And so you, what you may feel a little bit is a loss of breath, uh, if not a cough, when you breathe in cold air, especially if it's, going, if it's not going through your nose. So just a lesson out there, when you're out in the cold, do your best, to, if you can, to slowly try to breathe through your nose uh, because your nose is the most efficient way to warm up cold air. Great. Thank you so much. Um, one of the things, there has been a lot of questions asked, and they are great questions. Um, if you did not have your question answered, we will get back to you. The other thing is that you can always speak with your physician. And we also have our 1-800-LUNG-USA, which is our lung helpline. This is staffed by respiratory therapists and registered nurses. And they will also be able to answer your lung health questions. Um, again, please feel free to continue to submit them because we will get back to you. Um, Bev, is there any last minute, anything you wanted to mention last minute? 
I'd like to echo what all of our presenters have said, which is we appreciate you joining and learning more about the respiratory system. Um, huge thanks to the um, speakers who shared a little bit today. And um, this is just one of many resources that um, will be provided to you through the new Better Breathers Network. So we look forward to learning more about what you'd like to hear about and then um, sharing those resources back with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, one thing that will be coming once the webinar ends is a survey. Um, we would love to hear your feedback on today's presentation as well as any future um, presentations or information you would like to receive, um, maybe in the newsletter or something um, come next year. So again, please, we would love to hear back from you. Um, thank you so much for your time and have a wonderful day.